Lauren. So once again, welcome everyone. Good to have you with us on this bright, sunny morning, which like spring is definitely in the air. I don't know about y'all, but my yard is full of oak squiggles from the rain last night. It's like it's like the snow covers your ground. It's like oak squiggles are covering my ground and my car too. So get out in the yard today sometime. Anyway, Errol Rohr is with us today and will be with us for three weeks discussing um, mere morality. I think when I first saw it, I, I, I said mere mortality and Errol corrected me, it's mere morality. The faith of ethics and the ethics of faith. Faith. So he'll be with us for the next three weeks and we look forward to that discussion. Welcome any visitors on the um, Zoom call that are with us here. I don't know if, if everybody has been here before, but if you're new to the class via Zoom, we're welcome to have, glad to have you and look forward to meeting you in person uh, in the near future as we work on our reopening plans for the church. Uh, please remember to keep those on the prayer list in your thoughts and prayers, as well as those in the military. We've got a big month in May for the church and the May gatherings, including the Outreach Fair and the Jazz Under the Stars Festival. So look for more information on that. Uh, I think the church has sent out an email on that as well. Also, uh, Wilson, any other announcements from the church or anything? That little That's didn't, see, didn't see much else, but please remember if you have any questions today, as usual as, and as in the past, please just raise your hand or type your question into the chat function uh, in Zoom. So with that, Errol, we'll turn it over to you and we're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you, Drake, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all. I wish we could be in person together. I would feel more comfortable doing it that way, but uh, it's good to see everybody on the screen. Um, it's many thanks to Wilson and Drake and Mary D for their good work in making um, covenant class available during this time of COVID. And the title of this class, as Drake said, is Mere Morality. Maybe you are familiar with C.S. Lowe's book, Mere Christianity. Well, I'm, I'm talking about mere morality, the faith of ethics and the ethics of faith. So in three sessions, we're going to briefly explore the subject of good and evil. Why is it that we as humans call some actions good and some actions evil? Why is it that um, we can make any kind of determination like that? Uh, we're going to ask ourselves the question, are there any universal rational reasons for our judgments? And finally, we're going to ask ourselves, what does our Christian faith contribute to this discussion? So as I go along, please feel free to ask questions or raise comments, um, enter into discussion. I'm gonna be offering a case a little bit later this morning and I hope we'll get some discussion on that. So I wanna, I wanna start this morning with one of my favorite prayers. And I may use this prayer all three sessions, I'm not sure. But it's a prayer I pray frequently. It's a prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, a 13th century Italian theologian and Dominican priest. So would you pray with me, please? Give us, O Lord, a steadfast heart, which no unworthy affection may drag downward. Give us an unconquered heart, which no tribulation can wear out. Give us an upright heart, which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow on us also, O Lord our God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to be discussing 
ethics for in the next several weeks, a fairly weighty topic. So I think it's best to start with a bit of humor. Since it's close to tax time, we especially need some humor. <laughs> it, it appears that a man wrote a letter to the IRS saying, and I quote, I have been unable to sleep knowing that I have cheated on my income tax. I have understated my taxable income and have enclosed a check for $150. If I still can't sleep, I will send the rest. <laughs> that by the source of that humor is a book called Plato and Platypus Enter a Bar, an understanding of philosophy through jokes. That kind of got me through graduate school. <laughs> so there's nothing like income tax to bring out the best in us, especially when it comes to ethics. For the most part, we humans, or most of us at least I should say, tend to agree on certain actions as just and right and certain actions as evil, unjust and wrong. So let me ask uh, at the outset of this, uh, this class, uh, can you think of one action that we could all agree on that is good and just? Anyone, just one action that's good and just that we would all agree on? I don't think we can think of one. <laughs> Can you think of one action that we would all agree on that is not good, that is unjust and evil? I'm amazed. Not one, how about murder? How about slavery? How about kindness? about forgiveness. So I'm sure if um, we were in a different uh, venue and format, uh, we could think of many things that perhaps we could all agree on is good or evil or just or unjust. There are, however, some folks in um, academia or in the scholarly field or in just thoughtful folks in general who would argue that there are no such things as universal goods or universal evils, that they deny that there's any fixed meaning or any fixed correspondence between the language we use about certain things and the world itself, no fixed reality or truth or fact to be an object of inquiry. They hold the idea that the good or proper ethical behavior is what we alone, we individuals decide it to be. They hold that there's no moral plumb line outside the individual person. They hold that some of them have anyway hold that such things as facts are only interpretations. That is, we think uh, what we think are facts are actually alternative narratives about reality. And so for many in our culture, in our world, um, all claims of disinterestedness or objectivity or universality are bogus. So if such is the case, if that is actually the way it is, we're left with the idea that everyone should do what is right in their own eyes, or at least what the majority thinks is right in their own eyes. The book of Judges in the Bible makes reference to such a standard in Judges 21:25, and I quote, it says, in those days, Israel had no king, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. 
it didn't work out too well for the people of Israel. And it doesn't work out too well for us if we adopt the standard in our culture, our politics, our business, if everyone does what is right in their own eyes without an appeal to some kind of rational basis for it. It seems to me that our political climate presently seems to reflect, reflect such a relativistic understanding of reality. Facts and moral values would appear to be the fickle purview of one political party or the other or one cultural fad or the other. But I, I'm guessing, but I think I can assume that most of us do not agree with this rather pessimistic and narcissistic position. And if we do not agree with that, then we're left with this kind of question. Is there some kind of ultimate standard of right and wrong that we instinctively appeal to for guidance? Is there some standard outside ourselves that transcends our human experience? Or is there a rational basis for universal judgments? Is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. right when he says the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice? Is there a rational basis for even making that statement that there's a moral arc to the universe? Most of us, I think, agree that murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, torture is wrong, sexual harassment is wrong, racism is wrong, slavery is wrong. And so my point about ethics so far is this, it takes a certain amount of faith. Yes, faith to argue that certain actions violate a standard of right and wrong. It takes a certain amount of faith to assert that truth and good and right and wrong actually exist and can be reasonably determined. So in this regard, I'm, I'm equating faith uh, to trust. It's akin to trust, to trust that something is the case. And faith in this regard is a trust and a reasonable hope that we're on safe grounds with our ethical determinations. At least we're saying we trust that there's a rational basis for it. So I'm arguing so far that faith is connected to ethics, whether it's from a religious perspective or from a totally secular perspective. Faith is involved However, uh, as you probably are guessing by now and uh, maybe sensing in, in your own responses that uh, it's not as simple as I'm making it out to be. We live in a very complex world and ethical judgments are often extremely complex and they're confusing as well. So to dig a little deeper into this, I, I want to um, explore this a little more by discussing a case. And this case is a rather famous one. It's used in classrooms around the world. Uh, it's called the case of the runaway trolley. And I assume you all know, given your ages, you know what a trolley is. Uh, trolley is a streetcar powered electrically, a wheeled carriage running on a rail or a track. When I was a boy, I took the trolley to downtown Dayton, Ohio to attend uh, YMCA class. And thank goodness it was not the trolley I'm going to describe in this case. I first came across, across this case listening to Professor Michael Sandel uh, presented to a large class of students at Harvard University. So this is the case of the runaway trolley version one. By the way, there, there are quite a few versions to this case. I'm just going to give us one version of this case for our discussion today. 
So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are the conductor on this runaway trolley. You're the only person on the trolley and the trolley is out of control. Remember the trolley is running on a track like a train and can go only where the track takes it. And the brakes on this particular trolley are not working as you, the conductor, discover when you try to use them. So you're the conductor, you're on a runaway trolley, the brakes are not working. The trolley is speeding down the track and you, the conductor, notice that up ahead, there are five persons tied up and lying across the tracks. You are about to run over them. And if you do, of course, you will end their lives. <clears throat> you can't stop the trolley, no brakes. <clears throat> However, you know from experience that there's a side track just before you arrive at the five persons. And if you pull a certain level, lever, you can divert the trolley to an alternate track. If you do this, you will save the five from certain death. Unfortunately, you also notice that if you pull the lever and proceed down the alternate track, there is one person tied up on the alternate track lying across the track and you will end that person's life if you go in that direction. So if you got the situation, if you got the idea, you're the conductor, trolley out of control, no brakes, you're proceeding down the track, five people lying across the track, you will run over them and end their lives if you proceed straight ahead, but there is an alternate track. If you pull a lever, you'll go the alternate track. If you do that, you will run over only one person and end their life. So as the conductor, you have to make a decision. Do you proceed straight ahead and in the life, the lives of five people, or do you pull the lever, go down the alternate track and end the life of just one? You have two choices. So does anyone want to offer uh, an opinion as to what you would do. Would you proceed straight or would you pull the lever? How many of you? Harold, this is great. Off the top of my head, I would say pull the lever. And the reason but, being? Yeah, that that's those are not two very good choices. <laughs> that's very tough. <laughs> know any of the people? Pardon? Do you know any of the people? <laughs> <laughs> Would that make a difference? Well, I'm just saying. I mean, what if one were your child? And, and the question is, would that make a difference? Well, I, 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 in all honesty, I know it would to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or if it was five uh, convicted uh, rapists versus um, Mother Teresa. Yeah, but that seems to be the issue that I, I keep hearing from you here is that you can justify almost anything. I would jump. I would jump. I would jump. I would jump off. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you do, that's your decision. I guess you would go straight ahead and kill the five. <laughs> so you really only have two decisions, straight ahead or pull the lever. And it does seem to make a difference as to who the people are on the tracks. At least some of you think so. And why would that be? Because we're used to making um, judgments about who's right and who's wrong. We are? 
And, and on what basis do we usually make them? What, what usually pops up as a, a rational reason for making a decision like that? What would Jesus do? Some moral authority could inform us as to what might be the right or wrong reason. Uh, if, if it was our child and we decided to save the life of our child, what would be the reason for that? What, what's the kind of guiding principle? We have environments where we believe that saving the general of the army is more important than saving five privates. <clears throat> And then one could adjust that to consider, could saving the governor be more important than saving five senators? <laughs> and you could incrementally slice and dice that down and, and um, get real confused. Are we, are we sure we want to save any senators? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and we're appealing, it seems to me when, when we're using reasons like that, we're appealing to some kind of rule or principle or moral guideline that has been tried and tested or put into uh, some kind of codification for us to follow. Or we also appeal to things like consequences, right? What are going to be the consequences of our action? What would be the future consequences of our action? Is it better to, generally better to save the lives of five people versus save the life of one person? Unless we put into the, the equation the identities of those people. So, in the, the history of um, folks trying to think about moral decision making, it seems that we sort of come down to appeal to authority or a set of rules or principles or a set of consequences. And uh, sometimes we try to use a combination of all of that, either consequences or rules or principles and things like that, or loyalty to family, uh, whatever. So there are thinkers throughout our long human history who've tried to think about these things in a rational way. For example, uh, there's two thinkers that are very uh, very important in the history of ideas that have argued that we ought to appeal mainly to consequences for making our ethical decisions. And those two, two people are Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, two, two famous Englishmen. Um, they happen to disagree about uh, how we judge consequences, however because you have to begin to think about, well, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? Uh, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham says, the way to decide making a moral decision or an ethical decision is to come up with that decision that produces the greatest good for the greatest number. But they argued about the definition of good. Jeremy Bentham seemed to want to uh, identify good in a quantitative way. And John Stuart Mill wanted to identify good in a qualitative way. Kind of the difference between uh, Ben and Jerry's and Mozart. Um, so, if we're thinking about this case, the trolley, the runaway trolley, uh, if it's a quantitative decision about good, you might say, well, saving the lives of five is far better than saving the life of just one, if everything else being equal. 
But if you want to put quality into the decision, then maybe you want to make a decision based on who those people are, how valuable they are to society. Is there any one person, though, we might ask ourselves, more valuable than another? What constitutes the value of any human being? What, what constitutes a good judgment about the worth of any individual. Is a president more worthy, more worthwhile, more qualitatively important than a blue collar worker? It's the kind of decisions you have to make. Uh, in the medical field, uh, these decisions are having to be made all the time. Who gets the uh, heart transplant? Should we give it to those who can pay for it? Should we give it to those who seem to have most important positions in life? Or do we have some kind of a lottery? And you sign up and when your name comes to the top of the list, you get the transplant. How do we make these decisions? And uh, when we make them in one way rather than another, there are always people who won't argue with the contrary. So why is it, why is it that we just instinctively uh, value certain kinds of things rather than other kinds of things? Uh, so I've, I've told you about uh, Bentham and Mill who appeal mainly to consequences. Uh, the greatest good for the greatest number and, and an argument about what constitutes good. There are other thinkers that uh, wanted to appeal to a different set of values. Uh, things like um, rules and rights and spatial obligations and virtues. Uh, Aristotle was famous for uh, arguing that we ought to have always appealed to virtues like wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice, and try to arrive at some golden mean between uh, these various uh, factors. There was a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant who uh, appeal to one rule. He said there's one rule that can decide uh, your ethical dilemmas. And that rule is what he called the categorical imperative. And that, that imperative says this, act always in such a way that you can will your action to become a universal law. Always act in such a way that you could will your action to become a universal law. Kant said, it's always wrong to lie. And you can't think of a situation Kant would hold in which it's good to lie. Uh, I'm not sure he was right about that, but uh, we'll look at some cases that, that raise a very difficult uh, dilemma about that very issue. But Kant said, always act in such a way that you could will your action to become a universal law. Um, he also said, never, never, ever treat anyone as a means to an end. Never engage in anything that would exploit another human being. That's a rule you could always follow. There are other such uh, philosophers through history who came up with a, a number of rules. Uh, W.D. Ross had seven uh, universal rules that we should always follow. Uh, a, a rule of fidelity, a rule of gratitude, a rule of justice, a rule of beneficence, a rule of self-improvement, a rule of non-injury, and et cetera. So, in the field of, of ethics, at least from the rational point of view of people who've tried to think about this from a reasoned perspective alone, they've tried to come up with different ways of deciding moral and ethical dilemmas. Hey, Errol. Yes. I would just want to, going through those, that checklist of items in the trolley case that you mentioned, I'm not sure the conductor is going to have time to go through that checklist to decide what to do. 
I mean, that was, so to me that this uh, case you gave there was more of a quantitative choice. And it strikes me that depending on the circumstances, it, you might go by a different set of standards of what decision you make. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, something that uh, you've kind of learned, you intuit, it's just part of who you are as a person. You instinctively act in a certain way. Another, another kind of moral grounding. Uh, however, this trolley conductor does have the time. He is a very fast learner. <laughs> Earl? For the purposes of this case, anyway. Earl? Yes. Yes, uh, you know, what you've been saying has reverberated in my head so many times, especially the one talking about the trolley, because I remember that uh, you're moving very fast, but you'd be surprised how fast all these different thoughts can go through your mind. Uh, for me, it was always knowing beforehand what the rules of engagement were and who was okay to kill and who you didn't want to kill. And yeah, you run through all of those calculations so fast and it's amazing how you come up with a decision. But you're right, uh, a lot of times it's, okay, I'm gonna to have to face the consequences when I get back. And then you have to repeat all your rationale to another audience and hopefully you know, they're gonna believe what you believe had been the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Save, kill the one or, and save the others or, I don't know, it's, it's, it's difficult to do especially now when we're conducting, you know, basically it's assassinations from the comfort of my own living room. You know, you might hit the person you want to, but what about the other people standing on the corner? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, very good point. Um, yes, uh, I have a question here from a person in my room, my <laughs> dear wife. Errol, I was wondering when you talked about um, the code that lying is always wrong, I was thinking about Fletcher who wrote Situation Ethics and he has cases. Can you hear this? Okay. Uh, cases, uh, uh, one case that it was uh, right to tell a lie. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's why I said, uh, the, I think when we get to uh, next week's thing, what, what does our faith have to contribute to this? I want to present a case of uh, Corey Ten Boom, who was hiding Jews and was asked, are you hiding Jews? Right. Uh, so very good point. Um, just to uh, kind of flavor our discussion of this, I... I reminded myself of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Are you all familiar with that? It's a very important document uh, that uh, the nations of the world at least have uh, tried to appeal to when establishing some kind of uh, moral standards. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 10th, 1948. Of the 58 UN members at the time, 58 members in 1948, 48 voted in favor of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. None voted against it. Eight abstained and Honduras and Yemen failed to vote or abstain. And our own Eleanor Roosevelt was very instrumental in uh, mustering support both nationally and internationally for the adoption of this universal declaration. Let me just read a little bit of this and, and give you a few of the uh, articles uh, as just an illustration of the fact that we as human beings have really tried to come, come uh, together and establish some kind of universal 
uh, adoption of what constitutes good and just. Uh, the preamble to the, the declaration goes like this, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and, and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. They therefore proclaim this universal declaration of human rights. And here are a few articles. All human being, article one, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This is 1948. Article two, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Article three, everyone has the right to life, liberty and the security of person. Article four, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Article five, no one shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Article six, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. There are some 30 articles in this particular Declaration of Human Rights. Quite a document uh, established in 1948 after World War II. The major nations of the world affirmed these rights. These rights exist, they argued, because reasonable and responsible persons could get together and decide of their own free will and reason that such rights should be universally lawful and there should be penalties for violating them. So, I'm reminded after, uh, after looking at that, I was reminded of the courageous action of a particular Republican Senator from Maine, Margaret Chase Smith. Some of you will remember Margaret Chase Smith for her June 1, 1950 Declaration of Conscience. Does anybody remember that? Or remember what was taking place in 1950? Remember McCarthyism? So Senator Margaret Chase Smith in her Declaration of Conscience um, against the political and moral tragedy of McCarthyism. And remember McCarthyism, uh, a view that if you turn over any political or social rock, you will find a communist seeking to, to destroy the American way of life. Remember that? Lots of people were, um, were demeaned uh, because they were accused by McCarthy of being communists. So Margaret Chase Smith, after criticizing the Democratic administration for political ineffectiveness, said this on the floor of the Senate. Surely it is clear that this nation will continue to suffer as long as it is governed by the present ineffective Democratic administration yet to replace it with a Republican regime embracing a philosophy that lacks political integrity or intellectual honesty would prove equally disastrous to this nation. 
The nation sorely needs a Republican victory, but I don't want to see the Republican Party ride to political victory on the four horsemen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. I doubt if the Republican Party could simply because I don't believe the American people will uphold any political party that puts political exploitation above national interest. Surely we Republicans aren't that desperate for victory. I don't want to see the Republican Party win that way. Senator Smith's declaration reminds me of a quote from Sir Thomas More in the play, A Man for All Seasons. More says in the play, I believe when statesmen forsake their own private conscience for the, for the sake of their public duties, they lead the country by a short route to chaos. End of quote. Or take the action, um, uh, Wilson, could you put up the, the picture now of August Landmesser? I want to show you a picture. Or take the action of a man by the name of August Landmesser, at least we think that's his name, who appears in the famous black and white photograph from the era of the Third Reich. It's a picture taken in Hamburg, Germany in 1936 of shipyard workers, a hundred or more, facing in the same direction in the light of the sun. They are hiling in unison, their right arms rigid in outstretched allegiance to the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. If you look closely, you can see a man in the upper right who is different from the others. He's in the circle. His face is gentle, but unyielding. He is surrounded by fellow citizens caught under the spell of the Nazis. He keeps his arms folded to his chest as the stiff palms of the others hover just inches before him. He alone is refusing to salute. He is the one man standing against the tide. Looking back from our vantage point, he is the only person in the entire scene who is on the right side of history. Everyone around him is tragically, fatefully, categorically wrong. In that moment, only he could see it. I'm quoting from the book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, she opens her wonderful book with this particular passage. So Wilson, you can go back now. So, so to say that August Landmasser is the only one in the entire scene that is on the right side of history and everyone else is tragically, faithfully, categorically wrong is obviously reasonable to most of us, but it does take a certain amount of faith in the nature of the universe as good and just to make such a determination. As King said, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. If it does, then August Landmasser is the only one in that scene. But if it doesn't, God help us. Wilkerson, in her book, Cast, and I highly recommend it to all of you, asks us an important question as she discusses the action of Landmasser. She asks, what would it take to be him in any era? What, it would, what would it take to be him now? And philosophers from the time of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle to thinkers like Peter Singer and 
Edward Wilson, Alastair McIntyre, and, and so many others have tried to rationally establish that certain actions are good and certain other actions are evil. And their quest assumes, as the 20th century American theologian Reinhard, Reinhold Niebuhr argued, that life, that life is meaningful. And that takes faith, he says. He writes, the assumption that life is meaningful and that its meaning transcends the observable facts of existence is involved in all achievements of knowledge by which life and its richness and contradictoriness are apprehended. He says that in his book, The Interpretation of Christian Ethics. So the faith of ethics asserts that there's a rational grounding for determining that some actions are good and just and others are wrong and unjust, even though we recognize the complexity of that and that we're not always right. And that sometimes uh, we have to make really tough, tough decisions. And further, the faith of ethics holds that our actions and our, and our decisions should be in keeping with our actions. So next week, we're going to look at the ethics of faith, which will explore the contribution of our Christian faith towards the good and the just. Any, any further comments or questions? And thanks for your participation. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Errol. That was a fascinating discussion, I must say. It raises a boatload of questions, which I know you're going to answer for us in the next Absolutely. two weeks. I, I know, I know why you started, you know, the the class, your series like this, because you want people to keep coming back. You leave them hanging a little bit here, so they'll keep coming back for the answer. So. But that's a, that's a very fascinating discussion. And those were great, great, uh, the, the, uh, you know, symbolic picture, what you were trying to get across and the, um, you know, the trolley uh, case is a uh, fascinating discussion. I was just thinking about that picture though. Would you, maybe the, the counter to that is, would be like, were all those people who were hiling Hitler, they're, true believers i mean you caught them at one moment in time i'm sure all of us on the the zoom call here have done some things in the past that we you know regret doing but we wouldn't want to be condemned to you know eternal evil because of that one moment in time so i think the picture is symbolic of you know maybe standing up against but can you really condemn all those other people who were highly hitler at the time for that one moment but we don't know what was in their heart yeah. So anyway, that, that was just the kind of the contrary to the symbolic, the symbology of that picture. But anyway, uh, again, fascinating discussion. We look forward to having everybody back next week. Please tune in to the, the worship service, which premieres at 10 o'clock right after class. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks.